I want to continue a little bit just from where I left off uh, last night. And I want to just maybe kick off with a scripture that is found in John chapter 4. I'm not going to be talking about uh, fitness and faith in case I didn't come with my gym outfit. But I just felt like I wanted to continue in this direction that I'd started kind of off last night. And so in John chapter 4 verse 34... And uh, I want to I want to say this morning that you're looking all very good. Would you Would you just turn around to, to somebody and, and just tell them, "My, my, my," but you sure look good to me, and you look good to the Lord. It's so wonderful to be in the house of the Lord with other brothers and sisters and pastors and apostles and prophets and evangelists and whatever gifting you might be. And I want you to understand that. Uh, you know, we, 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 we're going to do this thing together. I thought I would have got an amen right there. We, we're going to do this thing together, all right? The Bible says two is better than one, right? And we often use that for marriages. If two is better than one, then I figure three is better than two. And if three is better than two, I think probably four is better than three. And five is better than four, and so on and so forth. Then the point I'm trying to make is that if we're going to impact our city and impact this country, South Africa, we're going to have to do it together. We're going to have to put aside our denominations. We're going to have to put aside our cultures. We're going to have to put aside from what tribe I come from and from what tribe you come from. And we're going to have to adopt a kingdom mindset. And I can honestly say to you, this morning that that's where we're in we're in this move called the kingdom movement if you want to call it that way which is a supernatural movement but it's about us together it's about you know forgetting about yes as a church you are busy I know and this church is busy and that other church is busy and we're all busy doing what we're doing right but to we have to understand that if we're going to do anything worthwhile, if it's going to be anything that's going to impact, we have to do it together. I'll never forget my dad-in-law, uh, Dr. Fred Roberts, many, many years ago when, I, when he asked me to come back to Durban uh, in the end of 95. Uh, it was about, I think, three to five years when I was back in 96 that he, he had a visitation from the Lord. And there he was standing by the edge of the sea, and he was bringing in this massive net that had, was full of a, of, of a huge catch of fish. And he was tugging at this net and pulling it with all of his strength. And the angel of the Lord stood by next to him and said, what you do, what you are doing, you will not be able to do by yourself. And it was right there and then that he began to contact some of the ministers in Durban, especially the ones that had done him harm and that had, you know, that were really unkind. And he went to them and asked them for forgiveness. And we then, uh, he managed to somehow, which is a miracle of all miracles, to get pastors together in a neutral venue. And I, 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 I think there must have been about three to four hundred people that were there on that day in a hotel. We, we, we wanted to keep it neutral in case people feel, well, you're bringing us to your church. We're going to that church. And, and they felt like territorial, you know. So we just kept it neutral. And he began to share this vision with all the pastors there. And, uh, and how that we're going to do this t together. It's not about one person calling the shots and, and uh, all of that kind of a stuff. It's recognizing the different giftings, honoring and uh, valuing the different giftings, yes. And as he began to share that, suddenly from the back of the room, this pastor got up. and Because God was beginning to move upon the hearts of the men and women that had gathered there uh, upon the pastor's hearts. And, and he said, Pastor, I want to just say to you, you know, when you left the full gospel church back in 77, 78, he said, I developed a resentment towards you. And, and, I, and, I, I, you know, and it was difficult for me to forgive. But today, I, I, I want you to know, I forgive you in Jesus' name. And right then, somebody else on that side popped up and he said, yeah, and uh, can I just say something? Stood up. He said, that pastor there sitting on that side, yeah, I want to just say, you know, brother, you did X, Y, Z to me, but I want to ask you for forgiveness. And I promise you, it was like, I will never, ever forget that moment. 
There was like a hush that came into that room. And God began to heal hearts. He began to reconcile people to each other. And men were hugging and weeping on each other's shoulders. There was such a spirit of unity. Such a oneness, such a, a spirit of forgiveness and compassion that flowed in that place. It was absolutely amazing. And then straight after that, we began to meet in various churches. We would, we would go around and meet in some of the churches in Durban. And we were having a great time for the sole purpose of just coming together and pray and be in unity and put aside our agenda, put aside our program. That's what we were doing. And you know how it is with man. Suddenly, you know, uh, suddenly ego starts boosting and people start feeling, well, I've been serving God one year more than you. And, and, and I know the Greek better than you. And so I'm entitled to do this. And for some reason, the pastor Fred now was finding himself more overseas. And so we would meet and the meetings were getting into this place where a pastor would come with all of his pamphlets because he's having evangelist X, Y, Z from America or from some country. And please, can you hand these out in your church? And we began to lose the plot. And those meetings are no more today. But I'm just saying that because if we're going to uh, do something great, I, I don't know about you. I, I, I don't want to just be mediocre for God. I may as well just go and club or something. Come on, if we're going to just be honest, let's just go and club. Let's just go and do what, what, whatever it is. But if we're going to go for God, let's go big for God. You know, let's, let, if we're going to do something, go big or go home. That's what Pastor Fred normally says. But let's do something significant. Let's do something impactful. That's going to, even when we are dead and gone, 30 years after us, 40 years, 50 years after us, there's still that wave of momentum of what was generated in our, in our time. Can I get an amen? So I want to encourage us here this morning that... It, this is about every one of us working together. As Apostle Nikki said, this is not about starting a, a, another network. There's, 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 there's network of networks of networks. Uh, you know, and then all we're doing is going around to network meetings. No, this is, this is something that I believe is kingdom orientated and comes from the heart of God. But it's going to take every one of us. To join in and become a part of what God is saying and what he wants to do in this nation. Can you say amen? amen. Let's look at John chapter 4 and verse 34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I, listen, I'm here to finish the work that God has, has purposed for me to finish. I'm not quitting halfway I'm not you know throwing the towel I'm going to finish whatever God started in me he wants to finish in me as well amen and then he says do you not say that there are still four months and then comes the harvest well let's wait for the fall let's wait until everything's good let's wait until we have enough money let's wait until we have enough theology let's wait until we have enough boldness let's wait until we've been serving God for 55 and three quarters of the years uh, uh, uh is that what it says? There are still four months and then comes a, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for, for harvest. What a powerful word that Prophet Lillian shared right now. But one of the things that she spoke about is, you, you heard her say, I wish you could see what I'm seeing in the spirit. I wish you could see what I'm seeing. If only you could see what I am seeing in the spirit. In other words, it behoves you and I. You see, we can't, we can't live our lives by the visible, by the natural. Like I said last night, if we look at our nation, I mean, last, this, this week, yeah, Monday, Monday, in the same day, we had two heists in Durban. Massive shootout. About two weeks ago, it was a huge heist. That actually caused uh, the highway by gateway to be, it was shut down from like I think at one o'clock till six, seven o'clock at night. Nobody could move. Dead bodies everywhere. I mean, in the natural, if you look at our nation and you consider crime and violence and you co consider corruption and everything else, in the natural, there's nothing for us to look at in the natural. 
You might want to find a high building, maybe trying to jump off the building because you will get depressed. If you look in the natural, you will get discouraged. But he says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes because if we're going to do something that carries any worth, any significance, if we're going to do anything that's supernatural, we have to go beyond the natural. It begins with what you and I are seeing. In another scripture, Jesus said in Matthew 16, he said, you know, you guys are very good. When you look at the sky in Matthew 16, verse 1, he said, what, when it is evening, you say it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. This is Matthew 16, verse 2 and verse 3. And in the morning, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening hypocrites. He says, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. It is important for us to be able to discern in the realm of the spirit. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about discernment because sometimes as soon as we say discernment, we think about witches and wizards and demons. And, and there is that part. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the realm of darkness is there and it is very real. But for goodness sake, I'm not going to spend three quarters of my time and energy and my attention, you know, on demons. Demons behind a chair and behind a bottle and behind every speaker, there's a demon. And behind, uh, I'm looking for demons everywhere. No, the reason why there's demons everywhere is maybe because you brought the demons. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that uh, a third of the angels fell from heaven. Which means there are still two-thirds. Why do we focus on the one-third when there's two-thirds? But we'll get on to that in just a moment right now. But um, I'm saying this because why? We're living in a very real, natural, sensual world. It's amazing when the doctors speak a word. We'll take that word. Oh, And even if we didn't have that condition, because we believe that word, we become that condition. And lawyers will speak to you and bankers will speak to you and economics, uh, e e economics uh, economists will talk to you. And, and, and what they are telling you might be fact. It's a fact. It's a fact that this is what unemployment rate is. It's a fact that this is what the Rand dollar is. It's a fact that this is so. Uh, but is it the truth? I think it's important that we need to differentiate between what is fact and what is truth. You see, I don't know about you, but I live by the truth that's found in this word. And the truth that is found in this word far outweighs the facts. You might give me facts, and facts will help me to pray. But I, ultimately, I must live my life but the, by the truth that comes that I glean from God's word. Amen? Hallelujah. Fact might give you knowledge, but actually truth will give you revelation. So in other words, if all I read is the letter of the law, I get a whole lot of facts. I can give you historical facts about the Bible and archaeological evidence and a fact about the Greek word and a fact about the Hebrew word. But actually, whatever is truth is of spirit and it has to become revelation to you and I. If all you are getting is facts from this book, then it means you are selling yourself short. You're selling yourself short. I don't want to sell myself short. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Did you ever think about that? He's the way, the truth, and the life. So you have the way on the one side and the life on the other side. And the thing that holds the way and the truth and the life together is truth. Way is important because way will give you direction. Way is your compass. Way will actually set where you are destined for. All right. And life. Life is important because life speaks of on your way to your destination. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? What is your behavior like? What is your attitude like? What is your motivation like? So on my way to my destination, my behavior is important. And what I say and what I think and who I am is very important. But the thing that holds the two together is truth. And we need truth. Can you say amen? amen. We need truth. 
And truth comes from the Word. When, when the Word becomes flesh and blood on the inside of you, when the Logos becomes rhema, then it becomes truth to your spirit, man. It becomes revelation to you and I. We live. We, man lives. Man progresses not because he knows theology, but because there is revelation. And I want to just encourage pastors and fivefold ministry uh, leaders and whatever your gifting is. You know, because sometimes there's intimidation, sometimes there's fear. And we, you know, we, your church has got 5,000, my church has got 10 people. And so there's like, ooh, you know. But actually, if you got revelation on the, ins on the inside of you, you don't have to be intimidated. You don't have to fear anybody. This is not about a competition. This is knowing who I am. And I can, I can tell you when, when, tr when, the, when the word becomes truth on the inside of you. Jesus said, man would not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from out of the mouth of God. When that word, when that logos becomes rhema on the inside of you, it don't matter what storm is coming your way. It don't matter whether you got five people for you or ten against you. It don't matter if it's snowing, if it's winter time, if it's summertime. It don't matter if there's a drought. It don't matter if nobody else shows up in church. If you've got that rhema on the inside of you, I tell you, the victory is yours. You're an overcomer just because of what you carry on the inside of you. So it's important that, that we, we have truth. And it's important if we are going to move in the supernatural, if you keep looking at the natural, you'll, you'll never get the supernatural. A lot of pastors are discouraged. You know why? Because they're looking. And it's so easy. We, 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 are, we are spirit, soul, and body. I know. But everything's about the flesh. We dress the flesh. We wash the flesh. We feed the flesh. We teach the flesh. We educate the flesh. We exercise the flesh. Flesh, flesh, flesh. flesh. Everything's about the flesh. And we live in a very natural, sensual world. But we have to understand that, you know what? I don't have to look at the things that they might be there. And they might generate a whole lot of facts. But I want to say truth is far greater than facts. The doctors might have given this predicament. Thank you for the fact, doctor. But I have truth that by the stripes of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, I was healed. There, there might be this thing. I don't know whatever it is that's coming against you. Maybe it's fear. Thank you for the fact. No, no, no. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a fact. But the truth is that 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. So truth is always greater than fact. And you have to keep reminding yourself, okay? You have to keep reminding yourself. Truth is progressive. And it is multidimensional as well. And it evolves as you grow. So we get saved. And that's wonderful. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We are justified. We stand before God just as if we've never sinned. But on the inside of us now, there is, there is the need for us to grow. There is the need for us to mature. So all of us is work in progress. And we grow and we mature as the Logos becomes rhema. As I, as I supersede the facts and I now begin to accumulate truth. And truth becomes known to my spirit man. We are essentially spirit, soul, and body. We must always remember that. I'm not a body and then I have a soul and oh yeah, by the way, I'm, I guess I'm a spirit as well. You are first and foremost spirit. And the reason why we are saying this and Jesus is saying, don't be governed by the natural. We're not here to educate and stimulate your, your intellect and give you as much information and give you another PhD degree while we're at it. We're, this is spirit unto spirit. This is deep calling unto deep. That's how we've got to think. If we're going to survive, not just survive this world, but if we are going to accomplish and do what God has called us to do, we have to override the natural. And it's a continual reminder. Jesus one time told his disciples in John 3.12, he said, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? 
If our minds are acclimatized to the natural and all we are employing is reason and logic and information and my education and my mental faculties and my mental capability, I will never, ever begin to understand the realm of the supernatural. Because with the mind, you cannot. You cannot put an equation to the supernatural. You cannot... Uh, compute your, your, your minds. Our, our minds are finite. The supernatural realm is infinite, multidimensional. We're trying to figure God out with our PhD that we got from Oxford. We'll never do that. We'll never do that. So, uh, 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 and the only way that truth comes when, you, when, the, when, the, when, when the words that are written in black and red in this book begin to move off the page and then float in the air and come into your heart. The only way that happens is supernaturally. I need to emphasize that. The only way that it happens where God unveils His Word to you and like you've read that thing a thousand times and now a thousand and one time, suddenly the lights are on and your spirit goes, Yeah, hey! I mean, it's like you, everything inside of you shrills and shrieks because your spirit man has discerned. Your spirit man has recognized. Your spirit man has laid a hold of that which is supernatural, that which is eternal, that which no man can take from you. That's why I say you can have spiritual truth and know on the inside and be quite comfortable standing next to somebody who might be a superpower or might have a mega church or might be miles ahead of you. You, it's, you, you will never be intimidated. You will never be intimidated. I know what I have in my spirit. I don't, I don't have everything. But as long as we do what Prophet Lillian says, spending time with God, praying, that's when the Logos becomes Rhema. So it's important that we have that. Okay, I'm, I'm getting somewhere with that. Our expectation for something good to happen must always be worked on. Because if we don't, what we read, what we hear, what we see with our physical eyes... What people are saying to us will stunt in you and in me the ability to believe God for good things, for great things, for awesome things. Okay? It's very easy to lose that. It's very easy to, to get tune yourself out of God and out of His Word, out of His presence, out of the Holy Ghost and start to filter in everything that's happening in the world. And very soon your expectation for good goes down to zero. And it's important that we keep expectation for good optimal levels all the time. Optimal levels all the time. Optimal levels. If we want to move in the supernatural... Hallelujah. You have to maintain your spirit man open for the goodness of God. Some of the great times that I've had with God, some of the biggest breakthroughs that I've had with God, in God, have been when I have just sat quietly and I've just thought about and meditated on the goodness of God, the benevolence of God, the kindness of God. The generosity of God. The, the unlimitedness of God. There's a great word for those of you that are highly educated today. Uh, it's called munificence. Which means the abundant generosity of God. The abundant big heartedness of God. The abundant, uh, abundantness, uh, uh, abundant lavishness of God. God is a good God. He wants to do some great things for you and I. And a lot of those times for me have been when I've just meditated on, on those good times. Now, I've had to do that. I've had to train myself to do that. I mean, when that dome burnt and I got the call to, to go down. I mean, I, I thought for a moment, this surely is a joke. Surely this is like the prank of all pranks. And I, lived, I live in Hillcrest, which is a good 25-minute, 20-minute drive, let's say. I did Hillcrest Durban in seven minutes. 
I'm just saying. That's, I mean, I was like, I need to get down there like yesterday. And uh, when I got there, the dome had already burnt and the fire was coming to the backside of it now and about to, uh, you know, devour where our offices were. There were some vehicles parked, some church vehicles. So we quickly moved the vehicles back. The fire guys that were there, I was told later that this was the rookie fire team. They, they'd never put out a fire ever before. I mean, you know, this was a rookie team. This was their first putting out a fire project. And it wasn't like a little campfire. It was like a huge fire. So we ran to the back, put the cars back. I ran to where the TV ministry is. There was another pastor there that was there with me. Actually, Pastor at Bosov's guy in Durban. He called me when I was in the car. And he said, he said John, I, I just heard that the domes are fire. Is that true? I said, Glenn, I think it is. Uh, he said, he said Do you, I, I'm coming. I said, no, don't worry. I, I'm, it's all fine. We, we, we got it at that. No, I'm coming, he said. And he was there. And him together with me and two other guys, we ran into the building because now we're looking to just try and take whatever we can, save it, try and get the cameras, try and get, but I remember things were crashing down. There was a strong acid smell because of the aluminum that had burned. And I took a look into the auditorium where the baptismal font was, and I looked like this, and I think that picture will forever be etched in my heart. Because it was like looking at World War III, like World War III had just taken place. Massive devastation. It's, it's an ugly face devastation in whatever form that you might see it in. And uh, we quickly scrambled the fire department I said please come let's try and stop the fires going up to where Pastor Fred's office he, and he like looked at me he said oh well, how do we get there I mean they were just very unprepared and so we try to grab the cameras and things falling eventually we realized we had to get out of there and uh, the next day it was like I just couldn't believe that this actually happened like everything just burnt. I mean, there was just nothing left. Just everything was burnt. And then after that, you know, on that night when, when the fire had finally finished, uh, I got a call from Pastor At Bosov and he said, John, I'm so sorry about what's happened. He said, I want you to know that we're sending the tent. I've got a tent coming. He said, and it seats 2,400 people. And he said, you can have that tent for as long as you need. And I thought, thank God, I'm not even part of CRC. I mean, I just know Pastor Ut, and he didn't have to do this. But, and sure enough, I mean, on that Monday, his guys flew down. They flew at their own expense. He had a whole team there. I was there trying to get this tent up, and we put this tent up. The minute it was after that trying to have church in the tent, they said to me, oh, you'll enjoy the tent. You know, it's like the revival days. And I got up to preach that Sunday, and I tell you what, it wasn't anything like the revival days. I could still see the pain and the agony on people's faces. The back of my mind, I'm saying, God, why, why? Like, why? Can you explain why? Why? And, and I can see people looking at me. We had a whole lot of people leave our church because they said, well, a church can't be a tent. That's not a church. And so in the middle of the pain of that fire, in the middle of the pain of uh, uh, having this massive devastation, we have people up and leaving because the tent's not a church. In the middle of that, we had one of our guys who used to be the vice dean, and he starts teaching in our Bible school this whole hyper grace thing. So we were now in error doctrinally. We had to sort that out. He'd influenced other pastors. And in a spate of probably, I would say, two years, man, we had a huge mass exodus. And I'm sitting in this thing, and I'm thinking, God, uh, is there anything else that, uh, that you need to prepare me for? Because wherever I'm looking with my natural eyes, all I see is pain. All I see is devastation. The more I look at it, the more dis I, 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 maybe just let the rapture take place right now. This would be a great time for the rapture to take place. See, I'm just trying to tell you that because if I just looked at the natural and I kept feeding myself the natural 
And there was a whole host of other stuff that you have no idea of what we went through as a family, me and my wife, with regards to this church. But I had to train myself. I had to say, come on, boy. Leave your emotions at home. This is not about what people are saying and the opinions, because everybody's like, Mm, I wonder what they did that this judgment is on them. I mean, people, crazy things were coming through. I mean, people start, you know, they seeing seeing things and what, what, what. And there's always this question mark. But I'm saying that because I don't know what hardships you are at or in. And if it's in the ministry, let me tell you, you can't be a, a, a ninny and be in the ministry. The ministry is not for ninnies. Let me just tell you, if if you don't have a backbone, the ministry will put a backbone in you. The ministry is not about people coming around you and caring for you and shame. And if that happens, praise God. But more than nine out of ten times, nobody will come around around you. Nobody will encourage you. Nobody will will strengthen. Nobody will say, you're there all by yourself. So I want to just encourage some of you because I felt this morning and last night while I was praying that some of you have been badly let down, hurt, burned, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. And you might have a justified excuse. But not when it comes to fulfilling the mandate. Let me tell you, the only thing that's keeping me in Durban is I know that this is what God has called me to do. I would have run 10,000 miles by now. And if God had not graced me, maybe you'd be visiting me in some mental asylum. If God had not graced me to be in that place and to go through some of the things that I had to. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I had to teach myself to think on the goodness of God. I had to put aside the burning of the fire. You think it's over now? Now we're sitting down and we're looking at the costs. (laughs) The insurance people looked for every loophole not to pay us. Finally, when they did, it was like not even half of what it was worth. Right? So now we're sitting with architects like this. And, I mean, the cost is exorbitant. The cost. I mean, we're talking here Durban, KZN. They said to build that dome, it's going to cost, and we're not even going lavish, it's going to cost $133 million. I'm saying... Is that Zimbabwean dollars or <laughs> like, are you mean rands? Rands? 133 million rands? <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, if the rapture didn't take place after the fire, now would be another good time for us to be raptured. And I'm saying KZN, where there, the economy is bad. Most of the people leave, are leaving KZN and coming up here because the salaries are three, four, five times more or, or going to Cape Town and, and KZN. I mean, KZN. KZN, Lord. Why KZN? But I have to always lift my eyes. I always have to think about the goodness of God. I have to ask myself, no, no, this is not about me. This is not about who's the wealthiest. Sometimes I'm tempted. Let me go and just meet with the wealthy people and talk to them and say, how much money do you have? Can you help us? I mean, part of me wants to do that. But I have got to train myself and you've got to train yourself to discern What's in the spirit realm. It's what I see in the spirit realm that keeps me coming back every Sunday to that congregation. To begin with, when I preached in that place, it was like nobody got saved for about three weeks. Like it was dead. People were just, it was dead, dead, dead. I, I, it was, it was there during that time when I, when I said, God, I, I need something here. I need something here. And he said to me, what are you looking at? What are you listening to? What are you talking about? There's nothing supernatural. If you just incline your heart to the natural and you're hearing what people are saying, that's just their opinions. I want to tell you this morning, it's just people's opinions when they talk about you, when they criticize you, when they ridicule you, when they try and find a fault. It's just their opinions. You will not build for God and build greatly for God if you're listening and inclining yourself to people's opinions. 
I told my wife, that's it. I don't want to hear anything from whatever, whatever camp, from whatever side. If it is not about the goodness of God, if it doesn't edify, if it doesn't exhort, I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. I refuse to have my ears as a garbage trap for opinions that's going to demoralize me and discourage me and make me feel like depressed. Listen, you've got to do that. If you're going to build for God and go greatly for God, you can't be around people that after you've been with them, you're like, let me go and take an overdose or something, you know. (sighs) That's why... I love traveling to Miami and being a part of Apostle Maldonado. Why? Because it it stirs the supernatural in me. I want to be around people that are seeing the vision, vision, talking the vision. They're dreaming the dreams of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you this morning, a third of the fallen angels fell. Let's focus on the two thirds. Let's focus. Somebody said to me, what do you see for Durban, Pastor John? And I looked at them and I thought, and suddenly the Holy Ghost just took over. I said, I see the glory. I see an open heaven, the ladder coming down, angels ascending and descending. I see multitude of people coming in. I see employment like never before. I see money coming into the church and businesses flourishing. I see people healed. I see addictions broken. That's what I see. Hallelujah. Because I choose to look into the realm of the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to wait four months or ten years or when I'm 160 years old. But right now, Jesus said, lift up your eyes for it is now time hallelujah praise God can you say praise the Lord in Hebrews 5 and 14 it says this but solid food belongs to those who are of full age that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern to what To discern, to discern both good and evil. In this world today, it doesn't take any faith whatsoever to see the evil. No faith. It's like it takes no faith to criticize a person. The most easiest thing that you can do, employing no faith whatsoever. Right now, you could probably find ten faults with me. But you know what? It took no faith to exercise that. To see evil takes no faith. You don't have to push in the Holy Ghost. You don't have to pray in tongues and see evil. You just open your eyes and there's evil and wickedness and corruption and calamity and sickness all over. Barrenness. It, 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 but it takes, it takes, the Bible says, maturity, fullness of age to discern. That's what it says there. In other words, discernment belongs to those who are of full age. Discernment, write this down, is a characteristic of spiritually mature people or people who are full of age. That's what full of age means. I do believe that we have that awesome ability to discern. I'm going to talk a little bit about discern, but let's quickly uh, look at it uh, at Philippians 1. This could probably be my last scripture. Philippians 1 verse 9. Paul writes, and I love what Paul has to say. He says, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more And more in knowledge and all discernment. What does it say there? In knowledge and what? All discernment. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You say, Pastor, why is it that you... Think about the goodness of God, the benevolence of God, the kindness of God, because that is what fuels the love of God in me. It's, 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 you you have to, like what Lillian was saying, you know, people do crazy things to you, sometimes without you even knowing it. And they develop all kinds of resentments and whatever, whatever. Our job is to keep our hearts full of love. Full of love. We have to. If we're going to build and if we're going to, Take this nation and take the cities of our world and demonstrate the supernatural, the signs, wonders, and miracles. We have to flush the bad out, flush the, the, those, those happenings. I mean, I've had to learn to flush all of that out of me. 
I've had to learn to flush what people said and what they did to us. I've had to learn to flush all of, all of that, all of that, all of that. Because I can't stand up on a Sunday and pretend. I'm, I'm not that way. I wish I was sometimes. I wish I could just preach and, 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 and still, you know, and pretend. I can't pretend. I, I, I can't pretend. So I've had to learn to flush all of that out of me. And allow God's love because the Bible says that now hope does not disappoint because the love of God in Romans 5, 5 has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to you and I. And another translation, it says God has given us a love transfusion. A love transfusion. Hallelujah. A love transfusion. He says there that our love may abound. It's amazing how love and discernment go hand in hand. Paul says that your love may abound more and more. See, for those of you that thought, well, like what I said last night, if you think we're just called to maintain, you haven't been called to maintain. Whatever you've been given, God wants you to increase it. The kingdom is about increase. For the government, what, what, does, what does Isaiah 9 and 6 say? The increase of his government. Everything about God is increase. I don't know, let me go this side here. Maybe there's more with faith. You cannot just maintain what God has given you. you your job, our job is to increase. Then when the next generation comes, they increase more. And so on and so forth. So everything about God is increased. Paul writes and says, Apollos watered, I watered, Apollos planted. But God gave the increase. So everything we do for God is about increase. And yes, it is about numbers. It is about numbers. You need to make sure who's the sheep and how many are coming and how many got saved and how many have got baptized and how many are in your discipleship. You need to, God dedicated a whole book called Numbers in the Bible. If numbers were not important. Whatever is important to you, you will number. You will go after numbers. The fact that you've got numbers because you saw how many got saved, how many got baptized, is because it's important to you. If it's not important to you, ah, it's not about numbers, you know. It's not about, it is about numbers because it's about increase. <laughs> Hello? I don't want to offend anybody here, but I'm here to say, no, no, no. Your job is not to maintain the status quo. Your, our job is to increase. What God, whatever God has allocated, given to you, our job is to increase. Okay? So Paul says that you love may abound more and more in knowledge and discernment. And I'm saying this because true love fully and properly discerns. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about discernment. Because nine out of ten times when you say discernment to somebody... They thinking wizards and uh, witch locks and demons and all of that. The primary reason why God has given you and I the gift of the spirit of discernment. Can I tell you why? It's to discern God. Number one reason. There is so much to God that we need to discern. Solomon knew him as the, the Lord is my wisdom. David knew him as the Lord is my shepherd. There, there is so much to God that we need to. So in other words, discernment is like the gift of discernment is like having a channel. You've got four channels. And we flip the switch by faith to the God channel. We keep our discernment on God. I want to sense God, man. I want to sense God. There might be demons there. And if there are, I'll flip it to the horror channel. Get rid of the demons and then flip it back to the God channel. But keep your discernment on God, for goodness sake. There's, there's, there's two thirds of angels that didn't fall. Let's focus on them. Let's focus on the goodness. Let's focus on God's love. Let's fo I know that there are strongholds. When, when God, when you flip your switch to the horror channel, deal with that demon thing and then flip it back to the God channel. There are four channels. The first channel is God channel. The second channel is the angel channel. Angel channels. Do you know that angels were common occurrence in both Old Testament and New Testament? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Hmm? Angels. We're talking about spiritual beings. We're talking about how people in this world have all kinds of sightings. 
that they're calling aliens. I wonder if those aren't maybe fallen angels, but actually angels and angel occurrence and angel activity was very common in the Bible days. How many of you would like to see an angel? Just keep looking here. <laughs> so we have the God channel, then we have the angel channel, and then the third channel that we ought to exercise discernment is when it comes to men. Discern men. Discern the spirits in men. Discern people. Thank God for our wives, Apostle Nikki, because sometimes our discernment is a bit faulty. We've had to send it in for repair, and then they have to tell us, be careful of so-and-so. No. The lovely people. This is what he told me. Be careful. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. I know this guy. He told me. No, I could see his eyes, man. I was looking into his eyes. Yeah. Two weeks later, exactly what your wife warned you about comes to pass. So we thank God for our, our wives. But we discern God. We discern angels. We discern men. And then we do, we do discern demons as well. But primarily, keep your switch using your faith. Keep it on the God channel. Amen? So this is what he says here. Look, in the Amplified. In the Amplified now, Philippians 1 and verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. And extend to its fullest development in knowledge and all keen insight. What your love may display itself in greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment. So that you may surely learn to sense what is vital. And a proven prize. What is excellent. There's so much evil but there's so much that is excellent that God wants you to discern. It's that which is vital and that which is excellent and of real value, recognizing the highest and the best and distinguishing the moral differences. You know, all these things that come our way is the enemy's way of distracting and causing us to go on a detour. And we expend time and we expend passion. And we expend energy into futile things because it's the enemy's way of getting us off that thing. Getting us off our eyes, off the supernatural. Getting it where it should be. Looking at the beauty of God, the goodness of God, the things that are excellent. The things that are of value, of real value. The things that are vital. There are some things that are not vital to the existence of your ministry. There are some things that will, not, that will bring harm to your ministry that you have to just shrug off and not pay attention to. You can hear the murmuring. You know deep down there's murmuring, but you have to shrug it off because no, that's a distraction. If, I, if I'm leaving Durban and I'm coming for Johannesburg, I don't go Trans Sky, East London, George, Nisna, Cape Town. Oh, yeah, you know, let's, let's, look, let, let's turn now and head up to Johannesburg. I get in my car straight, five hours. I want to be in Johannesburg as quickly as possible. I don't look for detours. Why would you want to be on a detour with regards to your purpose and what it is that God has called you to do? So he says here, come on, let's fix our eyes on what is vital. Let's approve and prize what is excellent and what is of real value. That word excellent, can I tell you what that word excellent means? It means that which is superior. That which is very good, eminently good, first class, first rate, five star, noble, mighty, glorious, things pertaining to noble status. The devil knows if he can get you distracted and on a detour, he's going to pull down that noble status of your purpose and your calling. It means quality. It means beyond, compare, unsurpassed. That word excellent actually also means out of this world. Anything that is out of this world is supernatural. It's not of this world. We are not of this world. Hallelujah. 
I want to just encourage you today, fivefold ministers, pastors, whoever you are here today, don't worry about the natural. Don't look for some excuse. Don't, we don't have to wait for a full moon or a blood moon or an eclipsed moon or whatever other moon there is out there for some special event to happen before we can demonstrate the supernatural and get on track with God. We can start right this very moment. We can start right now. We can, you know, just... Open up the door and discharge all those negative things and whatever, whoever hurt you and whoever did whatever, 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 whatever is not vital. It's not going to add to your purpose. It's the enemy's way of getting you off track and getting you to detour. Every head bowed, every eye closed right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, one of the biggest things that we as ministers face is the spirit of discouragement. One time when David came back from Ziglag after great victories there, the Amalekites, I think it was, had, or the Philistines had taken all his family, his children, his wives. There was smoke billowing out of that place. And I can almost feel David's pain. Like, was that, maybe that, at the pain that I felt when I was standing there and the dome was burning. And do you know that even the leaders started to point a finger at him, started to blame him? Would have been right easy right there and then for David to have said, you know what? Forget it. Forget it. There's no ways I'm continuing in this thing. There's no ways. I'm, you can have it. Here we go. Whatever you want. Just do whatever you want with it. But what does the Bible say David did? He began to strengthen himself and encourage himself in the Lord. It's lonely being in the ministry. Just don't even, I mean, it's, it's lonely. Sometimes you open up and you share things from your heart with others only for them to use that as weapons against you for your demise and your takedown. That's what happens. But the ministry is lonely, super, super lonely. And so this morning, I want to just, I want to pray for us. I want to pray for those of you. I don't know, I just felt in my heart that some of you was like, we're ready to quit, to give up, you know, ready to throw the towel in. Listen, brother, I want to tell you that thought has passed through my mind, not once, not 10 times, a million times, one million times, one million times. But you see, it's that calling that makes me want to just stay there. It's like somebody said to me the other day, are you really going to rebuild the dome? Are you really going to build the dome? I, I like looked at this person and I thought, are you really saying what I'm hearing you say? Have you been smoking something or something? What do you mean, are we really going to build the dome? But what does that mean? Like we're pretending. I said, well, first of all, this tent doesn't belong to us. Oh, you can just buy yourself another tent. I said, if I get to 70, 75, 80 until my time is up and I never would have gotten to rebuild the dome, I would have felt myself the biggest of all failures. I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror to know that I walked away. If, am I really, are we really going to build the dome? Like, are we really going to do that? Ministry can be quite mean sometimes. What people say to one another can really be hurtful. And I felt this morning there were some of you that had some wounds that were inflicted by colleagues and friends and ministry people. And can I just say something? Sometimes those wounds are needed. I'm sure David must have had some wounds when he fought the bear. I'm sure... There was a struggle when he fought with that line. But I believe that as he ran towards Goliath, he was able to look at those scars and those wounds that had now healed. And he was saying to himself, on the basis of my scars and my wounds that have now healed, Mr. Goliath, I'm coming for you. And I'm coming for your brothers as well. You see, those wounds are painful. It's fine when it's all healed. You can talk about them and you can love. And when they do come back and you can embrace them. And there ought not to be any bitterness or resentment. Sometimes 
it was just mm, I'm just I love you and I forgive you but I'm just I'm, I'm observing I'm observing I'm just watching sometimes it's like that right but today in this place I felt like some of you and quite a few of you there's these deep wounds that have been inflicted for whatever reason it is discouragement has come in like for example if I had to mention a name I'm just saying a person that you know oh that thing if like you see them on this side of the road you'll cross the road so that you don't have to no I'm cool I'm cool I'm forgiven them Lord I'm cool I'm cool but you have to cross the other side because it just uh, it's a, a sharp pain that you feel maybe there's a face right now that elicits that response in you I don't know I'm just I'm just that, that's what I what I'm what I hear the Lord saying and I do believe that if we're going to do what we're going to do, there will be scars. There will be wounds. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. So there are wounds. There are things that, will, there are things that we have to go through. But there's a time for when those wounds ought to be healed. And you can talk about that from a place of strength. I was there, but I had to pick myself up. And this is what God said. And now I'm a whole lot stronger. And I'm a whole lot better because life is about going through stuff. I feel today there are some of you that maybe you were misunderstood. Maybe some of you, they took advantage of you. That's one of the biggest areas. Or sometimes we're kind and we're too open. And people abuse that and then they trample all over you. And suddenly, like what you were trying to do out of the kindness and goodness of your heart, turns around and bites you in the back. I mean, if you know what I'm talking about, I feel right now that in this place, I really do. I feel a sweet spirit and God about to pour in his oil, the balm of Gilead, a healing that would come because you can be strong on the outside, but it's on the inside that we have to be strong. We can put on a mask. We can pretend we can fake it. There has to come a time when you have to confront that wound and you have to confront that affliction. Because why? Because there's a next battle that you have to overcome, which you will only overcome when I've healed from this previous battle.